And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Before you cross our threshold, perhaps I'd better warn you about something. If you can't stand the sight of blood, you may not want to hear our latest offering, because this is a story all about blood. Blood in its three variations of meaning. The blood ties of family loyalty, the blood of violent crime, and uh, just plain human blood. Think you can take it? Very well. Then please come in, pick out a comfortable chair, and try not to be too squeamish when you hear things like this. Benny, was there ever any blood on that knife? Hey, you trying to trick me? Answer the question. I told you I didn't cut that guy. Benny. No, it was brand new. I never cut anything with it. Are you sure? Absolutely sure. Not even your own finger. No. You can fool me, kid, but you can't fool a test tube. Our mystery drama, Thicker Than Water, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars J. Gregory. You're listening to what some people think of as jungle noises. But in this case, the jungle is what they think our large metropolitan cities have become. Stalking places for predators who prowl the darkened streets, the foliage of our parks, the isolation booths of our elevators and hallways, looking for victims to satisfy their greed, their hunger or their simple lust for blood. But the well-dressed man who walks down this particular dark and quiet street in a neighborhood of crumbling tenements and menacing shadows doesn't seem to be aware of lurking danger until danger stops lurking and strikes. Hold it, mister. What is this? Oh, shut up. Shut up and hand it over. The wallet. Where's the wallet? Here. In here. Give me that. And now, here's something for you. Help me. Somebody help me. May I come in, boss? Yes. Come on in, Olga. Thanks. I didn't bring you any flowers, but from the looks of this room, you didn't need any. I wish somebody would get them out of here. Place looks like a funeral home. Well, is it all right to ask how you feel? Go ahead and try. How do you feel? Don't ask. Oh, I knew I'd fall for that old gag. Now, seriously, Nick, how are you? You certainly look like your old self. Yes, I'm my old self, Olga. With something extra. An eight-inch gash in my side. Fortunately, it wasn't very deep. They keep telling me I'll heal nicely. Whatever nicely means. Oh, you poor man. Why did this have to happen to you? Yeah, why not? People get mugged in nicer parts of town than the place I was at. I guess the police were right. About what? They asked me why I was dumb enough to be walking around that neighborhood like a fat cat at 11.30 at night. They say I was just begging for it. Well, why were you there? I told you. I had an appointment with Roy Otis... Talked to him about the Parsons case. I thought I could get him to drop the charges if I went to his home personally and reasoned with him. Funny thing is, I succeeded. I was feeling so pleased with myself that I didn't think about what I was doing. So you walked right into the arms of the mugger. I don't know what I'm going to do with you, boss. I suppose you've seen the morning paper. No, I haven't. Story in it? Of course, the story's in it. And guess what they say? Yeah, I can imagine. Legal defender of muggers gets smugged. I'm sure they got a big kick out of that. 
headline writers dig irony. Well, they don't actually call you a defender of muggers, but um, you are sort of number one in the field, aren't you? Roy Otis, that Wilson boy, the Fredericks case... I never meant to specialize. And I can tell you one thing. It'll be a long time before I go to court to defend some knife-wielding punk. I knew you'd feel that way. Can you blame me? No, I uh, guess I can't, but that isn't going to satisfy Mr. Bleeker. Who? Well, don't you remember all those phone messages I've been giving you for days from Mr. Arnold Bleeker? Yes, I remember the name. I told you to tell the guy that I'm hardly in any position to take on a new case. Well, from what you said about your condition, you will be going back to work soon, right? Yeah, I'll be back at the old desk in a week, I guess. Well, that's what I told Mr. Bleeker. Olga, will you please explain that funny look on your face? It's because Mr. Bleeker wants you to defend his son. He's desperate to have you defend him. What's his son charged with? Mugging, of course. What else? Mr. Wedge's office. Oh, yes, Mrs. Hamilton, how are you? No, he's in conference at the moment, but I think I know the answer to your question. The hearing will be held at the municipal court on the 27th. Oh, yes, of course. And Mr. Wedge will be talking to you before then. Yes, I'll tell him. Goodbye. Good morning. Oh, hello, Mr. Bleeker. I, uh... I guess you're not so happy to see me, are you, miss? Well, it's not that, Mr. Bleeker. It's just that... Well, that I've told you it won't do any good. Mr. Wedge simply isn't able to take any more clients at the moment. Look, i got to get a lawyer soon. i got to have a lawyer right now. The judge told me either I get somebody or the court will appoint somebody. Well, you could do a lot worse than a court-appointed attorney, Mr. Bleeker. Even Mr. Wedge does that sort of thing now and then. He does? Yes. Most criminal lawyers do. Without fees. Well, then, let him do it now. For me. For my son. But I'll pay him. I'll pay him anything he wants. Really, Mr. Bleeker, it isn't a matter of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. You look at me, you see a poor man, but I'll pay. I'll get the money somehow. Olga, do you still have the file out on the Fredericks? Mr. Wedge. Mr. Wedge, please. I, I, I've got to talk to you. I've been trying to talk to you for days. Would you be Mr. Bleeker by any chance? I'm sorry, Nick. I told the man Please, that you could let me walk. say ten words to you. Have you got the time to hear ten words from somebody? All right, Mr. Bleeker. Come on in. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. No, no. I'll stand. I'm too nervous to sit down. Uh, Mr. Bleeker, I can save you some words. I know about your case. I know that your son has been arrested for stabbing that man. Only he didn't do it. That's the thing. It was somebody else, and they arrested my Benny. Well, I'm not saying that isn't possible. I know it's true. My son told me it was true, and I believe him. Oh, that's fine. That's the way it should be between a father and a son. But if he really is innocent, Mr. Bleeker, the chances are excellent that he'll go free. No. The chance is rotten. The way things look, there's almost no chance. That's why I need somebody like you... Somebody who got other boys out of trouble. I'm not a mastermind, Mr. Bleeker. Yeah, but you got them all off. All those other boys. I, I heard about you. I asked around. I talked to all kinds of lawyers, and they all said, you get Nick Wedge. Nick Wedge will get your boy off. Well, as I said, if he's really innocent, any decent attorney... I'll pay you what you want, anything. Just get my little boy out of that place. He's not too little, is he? Eighteen? He looked me straight in the face and said, Pop... I didn't do it. I didn't knife that man. You believe me, Pop? He said I'm swearing it. On Mama's grave. Mr. Bleeker, I'm really sorry. My schedule is full, and I was hoping to get away for a vacation at the end of the month. You see, I had a little accident myself recently. Papers made it sound so bad. They said there are witnesses. They say people saw Benny with the knife in his hand. How could they say that? People, strangers, why would they say that about my boy? Mr. Bleeker. I don't say he's an angel. He runs around, he fights. Boy without a mother, it's a wild boy sometimes. Now what can I do? I got a 24-hour business. I drive a fuel truck. 
I'll sell it, Mr. Wedge. You can have whatever I get for the truck. Mr. Bleeker, listen to me. After you started coming here, I looked into the case as much as I could. I can tell you this much. It's not going to be easy to prove innocence. Maybe impossible. But it is a first offense. And with a charge of armed robbery, well, the court might be lenient. So you looked into the case, huh? You didn't look far enough, Mr. Wedge. You didn't keep up. What do you mean? The man who was stabbed, he died last night. Who are you? I'm your lawyer, Benny. Maybe. You the lawyer my father told me about? One who gets everybody off? If that's what he's told you, he's wrong. Sit down, Benny. We have things to talk about. When can I get out of here? They told me I'd get out as soon as I got a lawyer. Whoever told you that was wrong, too. What about bail? My father says he can raise bail for me. Bail's been refused. What? You heard me. Now, this is a capital offense. The victim is dead. The charge is now homicide. The court has refused bail. You mean I gotta stay in this crummy place? Until the trial, yes. When's that? Don't rush it. We need every minute of delay we can get. I don't think this is going to be easy. Why shouldn't it be? I didn't stick that guy. I didn't have nothing to do with it. You admitted to the police that you were there when Kenneth Archer was stabbed? Sure I was there. I was hanging around with some guys. You were hanging around with a street gang called the Silver Stars. It's not a gang. It's like a club. We got a basketball squad and everything. Yay, team. We were all just walking down the street. When this guy, Archer, came right in the middle of us. Now, maybe one of the guys stuck him. How should I know? Benny, why do you carry a knife? It's only a Boy Scout knife. They sell them all over. I use it for carving things, like, you know. Carving what? Totem poles? Hey, whose side are you on? <sighs> all right, sit down. Let's go over facts the way the cops have them down. Anytime I say something that isn't true... You interrupt me, all right? Yeah. It was ten minutes to midnight on October 9th. You and four other guys, all members of the Silver Stars, were walking down Thurman Street. Kenneth Archer was rounding the corner and bumped into you. Somebody shoved him. And somebody called him a wino. And then there was a scuffle. Archer fell to the ground and everybody started running. Everybody but you. You waited behind and bent over the guy. I wanted to see if he was okay. Shut up. I don't want explanations. Just stop me when I say something that isn't factual. Now, you bent over Archer, and then you ran off. By now, there were a couple of witnesses. Both of them say they saw you with a knife in your hand. When they reached Archer's side, he'd been stabbed in the chest. His wallet was gone. Okay. Okay. So somebody stuck him. Why does it have to be me? Half an hour later, the cops caught up with you in your father's fuel supply office on Chester Street. The knife was still in your pocket. Well, it wasn't me. Are you saying it was one of your pals? No. I don't even remember who they were. You mean you don't give their names. That's against the code, isn't oh, it? It's a big club. This Silver Star's got maybe 50, 60 guys in it. I, I don't know them all. You're not helping yourself, Benny. And you're not helping me. Well, what do you want me to say? I didn't kill that guy. That's all I know. The police have the knife. It's Exhibit A. They have the knife. They have the witnesses. And they have you. Now, what have I got? You're the lawyer. You tell me. All right, Benny, I'll tell you. I want you to cop a plea. Huh? I want you to plead guilty. Are you crazy? It's the only thing that makes any sense. You put this case to a jury, you'll spend the rest of your life in a cage. Plead guilty and you'll get a break. I won't do it. I'm innocent. I'm not going to jail for something I didn't do. I'm talking sense to you, Benny. But I didn't do it. I swear it. I'm only trying to help you, son. I'm not your son. I got a father. No, Mr. 
Mr. Wedge, don't say that. You can't give up. You've got to help my boy. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. I... I know how you feel about kids like Benny. I know what happened to you. Well, that has nothing to do with it. If your son won't take my advice... But if he takes your advice, if he pleads guilty to second-degree murder... He'll go to jail for sure, right? Yes, he'll go to jail. For something he didn't do. Mr. Bleeker, I know you're his father, but that doesn't give you the right to ignore the facts. Look, a father's faith is a wonderful thing, but it's not a defense. Yeah. You're right. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, I better go. Mr. Bleeker. Yeah? All right. It's the dumbest decision I ever made, but... we'll plead not guilty and then wait for a miracle. Well... It looks like Mr. Nicholas Wedge stands a fair chance of going into court with a losing case. They say that preparation is nine-tenths of the battle for an attorney. But how does one prepare for a miracle? We'll find out shortly when I return with Act Two. Here we are in the criminal courts building downtown. And from the looks of the crowd, the case of the People versus Benjamin Bleeker has attracted more than usual interest. But it's not Benny Bleeker they've come to see. Benny is just another young ruffian charged with just another street crime. But the star of the occasion is the lawyer who will be defending him. And the point of curiosity is, how will Nick Wedge succeed in saving his client in the face of some highly damning testimony. Mr. Dankers, you reside at number 8 Thurman Street? Yes, sir. Have you lived there long? About 10 years. Please describe the events that you personally witnessed on the night of October 9th. Well, I was sitting on the stoop getting a breath... And these kids come up the street. They was all wearing purple jackets. Uh, I didn't pay no attention. On account of you see kids like that all the time, you know. They were uh, marching like in a straight line. Taking up the whole street, you know. And uh, then this man comes around the corner. The man being Kenneth Archer. I didn't know the name at the time. He was uh, just a man coming around the corner. And he bumps into this line of kids. Was there a scuffle then? Oh, yeah. There was a lot of pushing and shoving, all right. I mean, these were the kind of kids who thought they owned the whole street, you know? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Just describe what occurred, Mr. Dunkers. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. Anyway, uh, they all started pushing and shoving this man around uh, just because he bumped into them. And then uh, the next thing I know, he was on the ground. Mm Mm-hmm. Had he been hurt, in your opinion, or just knocked to the ground? Well, I couldn't tell, you know. I mean, uh, he was kind of on his hands and knees like. And what happened to the young man who knocked him down? Well, they all ran off, you know. I mean, uh, <laughs> kind of laughing and yelling stuff. All of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All five of them run off. Uh, only then uh, one of them... Turns back all of a sudden and uh, goes up to the guy. I, I, I saw him bend over him. Did he speak to the man? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I saw him reach down. Uh, I guess that's when he stabbed him. Objection. Sustained. Please don't volunteer information, Mr. Denkers. Just answer the attorney's question. All right, Mr. Denkers. What happened then? Well, then he ran off, uh, just just like the rest of them. But uh, uh, that's when I saw the knife in his hand. You actually saw the weapon? I sure did. 
But you didn't know that the knife had actually been used until you went up to Kenneth Archer. Objection, Your Honor. The assumption that the wound was caused by the weapon that this witness presumably saw is unwarranted. All right, I'll be happy to amend my statements, Your Honor, that Mr. Dankers didn't know that a knife had actually been used until he went up to the fallen man. Will that satisfy your objection, Mr. Wedge? Yes, sir. Go on, Mr. Dankers. You say you ran up to the man to see how badly he was hurt. That's right, and uh, by the time I got there, I saw all this blood on the ground. Mr. Dankers, how far away were you when all this happened? Oh, I don't know, maybe uh, 40, 50 feet. You got a good look at the people involved in this incident? Well, I don't remember what the kids look like, uh, the ones who ran away, but uh, the one who came back, the one who did this... Well, you know what I mean. Uh, him I saw clear as anything, and the knife in his hand. Do you see the man in the courtroom right now? Yes, sir. Yes, I do. That's him over there. All right, no further questions. Uh, counsel for the defense may cross-examine. Mr. Dankers, do you always wear glasses? That's right. Actually, even with correction, your vision isn't very keen, is it? I'm 67, mister. Wait till you're my age. It was almost midnight on a street which is lighted by a street lamp actually 30 yards from your building. Is that right? I never measured it. Well, I have, and you can take my word for it. The lamp is a good 30 yards from the scene of the crime, yet you saw a small jackknife. This knife, Exhibit A. Look at it, Mr. Dankers. Yes, I saw it. It's not a very large knife, is it? But I saw it just the same. It was uh, sort of flashing in the light, you know. To tell you the truth, I might not have noticed it at all if it wasn't for one thing. What's that? Mrs. Dankers, my wife. She was sitting right next to me and she said, Look, Saul, that boy's got a knife. <laughs> All right, Benny. Uh, let me get this straight. You claim that you don't remember the names of the other boys who were with you that night. That's right, Mr. Wickers. Even though they were members of your own gang. Uh, pardon me. Uh, your own social club. I just met him. I mean... Look, see, we all came out of this movie together. I mean, I didn't even talk to him. Mm-hmm. I see. Uh, Benny, you do carry a knife, don't you? Yeah. I mean, yes, sir. But uh, just a Boy Scout knife. Not a, not a switchblade or anything like that. In fact, you were carrying... This knife, on the night of October the 9th. Well, yeah, I... I always carry it. In fact, it was still in your pocket, that knife, when the police picked you up. Yes, sir. Uh, by the way, son, were you a Boy Scout? Who, me? No. Uh-huh. No further questions, Your Honor. Nick, would you like a coffee now? Uh, oh, yeah, Olga, bring it in. If you have some whiskey, bring that in, too. In fact, forget the coffee if you got whiskey. Oh, sorry, boss, but it has to be coffee. All right, thanks. Nick, it's not going so well, is it? Well, that's the understatement of the year. Do you think you made a mistake putting the boy on the stand? Well, I didn't know what else to do. 
I don't have any rebuttal witnesses. I don't have anyone to get up there and say that Benny Bleeker didn't have that knife in his hand. That he didn't kill Kenneth Archer. I figured the kid's own sincerity had to be my witness. Mm. Well, do you really think he came off sincere? What do you think? Me? Oh, I just sharpen the pencils and make the coffee and, judging from your expression, not very well. Well, it's not the coffee. It's me. I've got a bad taste in my mouth. It's called premonition of disaster. You're going to lose, aren't you? As far as I know, there's only one person in the whole world convinced of that kid's innocence. Unfortunately, that person is his father. Too bad you can't get him on the stand. He won't make a convincing character witness. Although he did a good job on me, didn't he? Mm -hmm. If it hadn't been for that guy, I'd never have taken this case. Nick, do you know something? You don't look well. Losers never look well. When this is over, you ought to see your doctor again. Maybe that knife wound is acting up. A head shrinker, that's what I ought to see. No, I mean a doctor. You know something? It's a thought. Maybe I ought to see Doc Haggerty. Who's he? Well, you remember Haggerty on the Hoster case, 1969? Oh, well, he's not the kind of doctor. I mean, he's a sort of biochemist, isn't he? That's right. He's got an office at Dugan Hospital. Olga, I'm going out. If anybody wants me, I'll be back around four. You mean you're going to see him now? Yes. To find out if he's got any good medicine. <laughs> understand you, Nick. You say the police have already examined the boy's knife for blood stains using the standard benzidine test. That's right. It didn't show any. But that didn't mean anything. They claim that naturally Benny would wipe the knife clean. Well, that stands to reason. But you told me once that there was a more sensitive test for blood stains. Remember? Yes, there's another test. It's called the reduced phenophthalene test. It's far more sensitive, in my opinion, but it's... Uh... Not universally accepted. Why do you ask? Doc, I want to make that test. <laughs> well, all right. Get me the boy's knife. I can't do that. It's court property. Exhibit A for the prosecution. But could you demonstrate the test for me with another knife? One just like it? I suppose so. If you have one like it. I do, right here. I picked this up on the way over. It's identical to the knife Benjamin Bleeker carried. Pretty cheap, too. Buck 98. Well, the cheaper the better. Why do you say that? I'll show you. First, I'll uh, mix up some of the reduced phenophthalene solution. Then, when it's done, we'll dip the knife blade into some whole blood... Wipe off every trace and dip it into the solution. And even after it's wiped, a stain might appear? Well, that's what I meant by a cheap knife being better. In a cheap knife, the blade is porous, so it retains microscopic quantities of blood. Even after it's wiped off, well, uh, let's see what happens, huh? All right, Nick. You ready for the test? Ready when you are, CB. Okay. Now, first, we'll dip the blade into the whole blood. <laughs> Where do you get that stuff? From vampires? All right, then we'll wipe it absolutely clean. There. Does that look clean to you? Like a whistle. Okay. Now, we'll place it in the solution and uh, watch carefully. Hey, stuff's changing color, turning pink. Well, you see what I mean? What appeared to be a perfectly clean blade isn't clean at all. The blood tells a story. That's really amazing, Doc. In fact, the blood stains might have been there years ago, and this test would still show them up. So if I took the kid's knife, put it into the solution, and it turned pink... You'd be one lousy lawyer, Nick. You'd be sending your client to prison. Yeah, maybe. And uh, 
maybe unfairly, too, because, you see, the test doesn't prove whose blood is on the knife. Even if your client just cut his own finger once, it'd uh, work just the same. He'll look just as guilty. All right. That's something I can straighten out with him. Right now. Hello, Benny. Hi, Mr. Wedge. Benny, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I've got something important to ask you. I've got an idea that may save your skin, but I have to know something. And it's got to be the truth. What is it? There's a test, Benny. A test that can determine whether or not there was ever blood in that knife of yours. Ever. Understand? Yeah. So what? Well, I intend to make that test in court tomorrow. If it's negative, the jury will know that you didn't kill Kenneth Archer. Oh, I don't understand that kind of stuff. I'm not asking you to understand. If you stab that man, a jug full of chemical is going to turn pink. And you can kiss your freedom goodbye. But there's something else. If you ever cut anybody with that knife, even yourself, that chemical will turn pink. So I want you to tell me now, was there ever blood on that knife? Hey, you're trying to trick me? Answer the question. I told you I didn't cut that guy. Benny. No, it was brand new. I never cut nothing with it. Are you sure? Absolutely sure. Not even your own finger. No. You can fool me, kid, but you can't fool a test tube. I'm telling you the truth. All right, Benny. We'll see how true it is. We'll give that knife a bath tomorrow. And God help us both if you lied to me. Well, it looks like Nicholas Wedge is facing a real test in that courtroom tomorrow. He'll be putting his own convictions on the line in order to avoid conviction for his client. Personally, I plan to attend that court session, and you will too, simply by staying right where you are. Until I return shortly with Act Three. Once again, the trial of Benjamin Bleeker is a well-attended affair. But the spectators have no idea that they're about to witness a dramatic experiment in which chemical science will be matched against eyewitness testimony. But let's quiet the courtroom now because the judge has something to say. Uh, Mr. Wickers, is the prosecution prepared to make its summary? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Wedge? Your Honor, something has occurred which I consider of paramount importance to this case. I ask the court's permission to introduce new evidence for the defense. Objection. The defense has had sufficient time for the introduction of evidence. I suggest this is a delaying tactic. What sort of evidence, Mr. Wedge? It's a demonstration, Your Honor. A demonstration which will, in my opinion, clearly establish my client's innocence. Or, for that matter, his guilt. What could that be? Your Honor, if Mr. Wedge would like a postponement... I don't want a postponement. I want to make this demonstration now. If I may be permitted to describe it to the court. Mr. Wickers, if the prosecution has no objection. All right, very well, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Wickers. If I may come forward, Your Honor. What is it you have there, Mr. Wedge? This box, Your Honor, contains a beaker with a chemical solution formulated for the detection of blood stains. Oh, one moment, Mr. Wedge. Are you introducing expert testimony? Please indulge me, Your Honor. Just let me explain what it's all about. Very well. If I may have Exhibit A. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you've seen this exhibit many times in the course of this trial. The knife which presumably killed Kenneth Archer. The knife which was in the possession of Benjamin Bleeker on the night of the slaying. Now, when someone is killed with a knife, what happens to that weapon? Invariably, it becomes covered with blood. And yet, during this entire trial, not one mention has been made of that word. Well, I mention it now. 
Blood. Look carefully at this weapon. I'm sure you all know that it has never left the court's possession since my client was arrested. Now look at this blade. You see how clean and shiny it is? That's not surprising. The knife is new, purchased only a few weeks ago. But what may surprise you is that this clean, shiny blade can still tell a story of guilt or innocence. For as every chemist knows, there is a virtually infallible test which can determine whether an object of such porous metal has ever touched even one drop of blood. Your Honor, I intend to prove once and for all whether I have been defending a young man falsely accused or a lying murderer. I intend to dip the blade of this knife in a solution of reduced phenophthalene, the most sensitive of all blood detection chemicals. Uh, one moment, Mr. Wedge. Yes, Mr. Wickers. You say that this beaker contains what? Well, I'll try to pronounce it a second time, Mr. Wickers, although the first was tough enough. Reduced phenophthalene. And how can we be certain that it contains this uh, solution? Could be lemonade, as far as we know. I have a statement here from Dr. Harold Haggerty of the Dugan Hospital, testifying as to the contents. Uh, one moment, please. If you plan to produce expert testimony, why isn't that expert here to testify? I don't plan to call a witness, Mr. Wickers. I plan only to make this test. But you are aware that the accepted blood test in this county is the benzene test, which is... If the prosecution will allow me to conclude my statement... Mr. Wedge, do you presume to be a greater expert in forensic chemistry than the county police laboratory? I'm not presuming anything. I'm telling you that if the knife blade turns this solution pink... It will prove beyond a doubt that there was blood on Benjamin Bleeker's knife. But if it remains clear... Your Honor, objection. State your objection, Counselor. This is the most ridiculous and flamboyant thing I've ever seen in the courtroom. The police laboratory has already made the standard test of the weapon and found no blood stains on the knife. It was wiped clean. But, Your Honor, the sensitivity of this test At is... At no time during this trial has the prosecution denied that absence of blood stains. Mr. Wedge is planning to demonstrate something we already know, using a test which is not accepted as standard laboratory procedure. I suggest that this so-called demonstration is pure theatrics, intended to mislead and confuse the jury. Uh, Mr. Wedge, Mr. Wedge, the court must agree with the prosecution. You are not a qualified expert in forensic chemistry. Mere cooperation of the police laboratory report is uh, gratuitous evidence which must be considered inadmissible. But my client was willing to have me make the test. Don't you see? He knew the chance he was taking... I'm sorry, the demonstration is improper. The objection is sustained. But, Your Honor... Sustained, I... Mr. Wedge. You cannot make the test. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I believe that Benjamin Bleeker is innocent. I believe this because of a test which I was not permitted to make. This boy knew that the results of this test might have condemned him to life in prison. And yet, Benjamin Bleeker told me to proceed. What could be more obvious? That no guilty person would have done so. <laughs> Will the foreman of the jury please rise? Has the jury reached its verdict in this case? We have, Your Honor. How do you find the defendant, Benjamin Bleeker? Guilty or not guilty? We find the defendant not guilty. Oh, <laughs> Bless you, Mr. Wedge. God bless you for what you did out there. Yeah. 
You really did a job on him, Mr. Wedge. Gee, thanks a lot. I didn't ask you in here to congratulate me. I had another reason. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know we should talk about the fee. No, Mr. Bleeker. It's not my fee I'm worrying about. It's my conscience. Your conscience? Why? Because of what I just did. Yeah, but you saved my boy. Yes, I know. But in order to do that, I had to resort to exactly what the prosecuting attorney called pure theatrics. What? I, uh... I don't understand. I didn't want to make that test. Do you understand? I didn't want to make it. Didn't even plan on making it. I would have had to, I suppose, if there was no objection. But that was the chance I took. Oh, wait a minute. You... You didn't want to? If the stuff in this beaker had turned pink, it would have been all over for your son. I was counting on the prosecution objecting. I wanted their objections. Because I thought the jury would be impressed. Simply by the fact that we were volunteering this experiment. Yeah, but if you had made the test, it would have been all right, too. How do you know? Well, because it would have been. Because what my son said was true. Well, there's only one way we can really know that, isn't there? You see this, Mr. Bleeker? Hey, that's my knife. That's right. Exhibit A. What are you going to do? We're going to make the test that that judge wouldn't allow. We're going to make it privately. Just for us. But why? What does it matter now? It matters to me. That's why. Hand me that knife, please. The knife? Give it to me. Don't you want to know the truth, too? The truth. Ah, Pop! Pop, for the love of... Pop, what are you doing? Bleak, what are you doing with that knife? I'm... I'm cutting myself with it, Mr. Pop. Wedge. Cutting my hand with Pop. it. Pop! Pop, are you crazy? Here. Here, Mr. Wedge. Here's your knife. Make your test now. Well, that's what I would call a bloody good demonstration of fatherly affection. Maybe Nicholas Wedge will never know whether his client was guilty or innocent, but he'll never forget that he's seen vivid proof that blood is indeed thicker than water. I'll be back shortly. I hope you noticed something at the beginning of this program. I warned you that if you couldn't stand the sight of blood, you might find this story too gory for your tastes. But, uh, of course, you haven't seen any blood flowing on the Radio Mystery Theater. You imagine it. And perhaps that's the most gruesome experience of all. We hope that you'll return for another gruesome experience. Our cast included Jay Gregory, Robert Dryden, Bob Caliban, Grace Matthews, and Ira Lewis. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>